can start. And uh, yeah. Rachna Madam, no? Rachna Madam is there. Yeah, Rachna Madam is there. Rachna Madam, uh, Imanshu uh, DP. Yes, sir. Rachna got yeah. now. Rachna Madam. Yeah, we can start. People slowly, slowly start joining. See, Karmaka sir is already there. Yes. So very good afternoon, uh, everybody. On behalf of Hindi Vidya Pachaya Samiti's Ramnarayan Junjunwala College, I extend a very warm welcome to each one of you present here in this room today for the seventh lecture in the series of uh, RJ College Guest Lecture Series. This was uh, initiated in this uh, lockdown period by just a thought floated by our director, Usha Madam. And then uh, departments pitch in, the guests were arranged and our dearest DP technical wizard made it all possible for us to meet day after day, hearing to people from different walks of life, be an economist, be a doctor, be a scientist, be an educator. And we are here today on the seventh day where we have our guest all the way from USA. Uh, Arch is a roommate. Vyakti, college we भी आज यहाँ मौजूद हैं हम सभी के चहिते कर्मकर सर सर आज आपका यहाँ स्वागत है सातवें दिन के इस चरण में आपका यहाँ होना हमें आशीर्वाद के रूप लगता है और आपके बारे में हम कितना भी कुछ कह दें बस सबसे सुंदर अभिव्यक्ति अगर किसी की है तो हमारी उषा मैडम की है तो मैं और एक बार फिर चाहूँगा कि दो और फिर मैं रचना मैडम से निवेदन करूंगा कि वे आज के अपने गेस्ट का फॉर्मल इंट्रोडक्शन दें आज का फॉर्मेट एक्सप्लेन कर दें ताकि पूरे इस प्रवचन का व्याख्यान का हम पूरा आनंद उठा सके सो so, पहले उषा मैडम सर यहां है हम सभी की ओर से आप हमारी भावनाएं सर के लिए या रिस्पेक्टेड कर्मकर सर अ ग्रेट टीचर हु हैज मेंटर्ड many 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 students one of them being me and uh, each and every uh, lesson or whatever he taught simple anatomy to a very complex photosynthesis i remember everything and i'm very sure each and every student of his would voice the same opinion sir was a great person as a teacher, as an able administrator, he was the principal of Junjunwala College for many years, as head of the department, chairman, board of studies, uh, faculty of science, and he has contributed immensely. Whatever research culture we have, we have imbibed from Sir, and way back 1962, Junjunwala College has been highly privileged to have a research department in the Department of Botany. So in absence of a university department, the College of Junjunwala College has really grown because of the leadership provided by Dr. Karmarkar. So in a college to have more than 100 PhD students, I think speaks volumes. And uh, there was a time when there was no research center anywhere else. So we used to have people coming from all colleges. So it was really fun. And we have maintained the same culture. The lab keys are with everyone. The freedom that we enjoyed that time, we continue to enjoy till today. And it is all because of Sir's blessings. And as you can see, Sir, is always updated. The other day I said, sorry, lecture legion regulation of photosynthesis C4 pathway. The, he, he said, ha, le sakta hu. So sir is always learning and that shows the greatest quality that a teacher is a lifelong learner. So sir, we uh, start this session with your blessings and we have a very young, talented uh, uh, teacher because I think she is basically, even though a very good researcher, she's a good teacher. That is why she agreed for coming for this session. Karishma, you are really blessed. And uh, welcome you. back to India. It's a great country, as you know. Yes. And uh, USA, USA, but Bharat Mahan. Yes. So with this, I very request a colleague, Rachina, to formally introduce you. Sure. 
yeah thank you very much dr usha mukundan for giving me this opportunity to welcome our honored guest for the day it is the seventh lecture in the series of our popular lecture i would like to introduce dr uh, karishma kaushik she has done her mbbs and md from university of mumbai after which she has uh, done her phd in the field of molecular genetics and microbiology from university of texas austin usa her topic of research over there was novel strategies to overcome bacterial drug resistance uh, after her phd she was a faculty in the same uh, place and a teaching faculty she has recently come back to india to university of pune as a uh, teaching faculty at institute of bioinformatics and biotechnology she is a recipient of several awards and fellowships and also has various publications to her credit today she is going to talk on a very interesting topic biofilms and beehives the uh, topic is bacterial cities understanding the impact and implications of biofilms i now welcome dr kaushik to start her lecture to uh, the audience i am requesting you all if you have any queries put them in the chat and at the end of the session we'll be taking up the queries thank you very much yeah with one permission i we also have dr ingle with us uh, it's really uh, nostalgic ingle sir welcome namaskar ani mala maithe tumhi khub enjoy karnar aat sa lecture so karishma yes so thank you usha ma'am and uh, thank you rachna for the introduction uh, i hope you can hear me i hope everyone can hear me yes yes we can Please. okay excellent yes, yes we can feedback via chat is also excellent uh, you know when you hear your cv from someone else like what rachna told me it suddenly you feel who are you talking about you know uh, and um, she brought back memories of my phd in the us i had i had to be honest forgotten the topic of my thesis so rachna has uh, now put me in the spot that i have to discuss biofilms and antibiotic resistance so thank you and thank you for the opportunity uh, i will say one thing that you know these are strange times and uh, i hope that you know bringing a little science to you today but in a very um, fun enjoyable relatable manner will help us at least spend one hour doing something else than fretting about the pandemic uh, so shall we begin Yes, please. Okay, yes. great. Excellent. So, um, I work at University of Pune. I'm a uh, faculty there. I reactivated my I activated my Ramalingam Swami Fellowship on my return to India, and our lab studies biofilms. However, biofilms remain these entities that are very well understood at university level in advanced research settings, but it still hasn't percolated into early college, high school, and non-specialized education. so a um, member of my lab snehal kadam who is with me and ankita who works remotely with us from bangalore have created this teaching primer the whole uh, the whole idea is if you want to explain a complex concept like biofilms to people who are not field experts how would you do it uh, so let's dive into it straight away uh, so that's snehal and ankita um so the idea behind this primer is to say that can we explain or can we understand complex science using simple analogies right and i think most of us are familiar with analogies of course analogies have pitfalls so we want to take you through this primer to explain biofilms and then you know help understand the pitfalls and get your feedback on it so since this is a teaching module which we want to develop further i really do request you to give us feedback at the end using a small survey it's pretty much yes no answers so it's not going to take up too much of your time uh, will is that okay is that does that sound good yeah good 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 excellent so uh, welcome you can use the chat window to interact uh, at this point i'm just talking to myself on the computer screen so i'm very happy to interact with you all uh, even hello and yes is great and i will start that going okay so let's get started with how do we understand complex science through analogies so the first question is what is an analogy right uh, it's basically a comparison all right between two things and the whole idea is to typically explain one thing which is difficult to understand using something else that is easy to understand right or something which you are more familiar with so in everyday life we have analogies like you know 
life is a box of chocolates you never know what you're going to get now it doesn't really mean that you live life in a box of chocolates okay you can't map every feature of life to chocolates but you, a box of chocolates but you map many features like you know it may be there are different flavors there are different colors there are different choices or that life is full of surprises you know you don't know what's going to happen next just like you bite into a chocolate or you open a chocolate box so i think you're getting the point here right so to take it to a little analogy that might have been close to our hearts or close to some of your hearts right now is or at some point in our life is finding a good man or woman is like finding a needle in a haystack so who, the younger crowd in the group how many of you agree with this okay you can be honest come on even if this is being recorded agree okay excellent so the younger crowd is agreeing and i can say i definitely agreed with this till up to 12 years ago so yes so it basically means it doesn't mean that a man, the man or woman you're going to find is as small as a needle or that he he is going to be hidden in a haystack i mean this is not really a bollywood version of romance but it means that it's as hard as finding something like that it's as hard as finding a needle in a haystack you know it's tough to find the right person and it's going to be tedious and it's going to be time consuming so thank you all for your agrees so you're just mapping some common features what this is to this i just want this to uh, get out of the way one thing that you can't map everything a analogy is some things will be similar there will be other things that are different now when we use analogies in science we need to understand what is different as well because we cannot lead to misconceptions in the process so for example let's look at an analogy in science since we've looked at some everyday analogies and we've broken the ice let's look at some science analogies for example um an arm is to a leg as a hand is to a foot this is a simple analogy you're basically comparing two parts right uh an arm is analogous to our say thigh the upper part of our leg or our leg whichever way you look at it and a uh, hand and a foot they pretty much are structured similarly to the arm and the leg so you agree with me on this now something a little more complex than just parts it could be a surgeon's glove to her hand should be as a key to a lock which means when a surgeon chooses a glove the glove should fit perfectly just like a key would fit a lock right it should be a so this is not as simple as parts but it is going to map to relationships like a surgeon's glove fitting well is like a key fitting well into a lock all right so we are trying to get a little more complex in our analogies just to you know get out of the way what they are and what their limitations are so is this okay with everyone sounds good i see chaya tanya prapti shiv bindu all of them have been responding okay anyone wants to share any other everyday analogy that you have or you're going to leave it to the end any other analogy somebody wants to share okay no problem i uh, type it in if if you think of it otherwise we'll move on i have a big analogy to share and that of uh, biofilms and beehives so let's get to that now some analogies may be even more complex for example if you think of water flowing through a pipe if you want to teach this at school level like blood flowing through a blood vessel is similar to water flowing through a pipe yes there are many common features the structure of the tube or the pipe versus the structure of a blood vessel the fact that there is a liquid flowing through that pipe and it is flowing through right however there are also many things that are different for example blood is not the same thickness as water we've heard the saying blood is thicker than water so the viscosities of these fluids are different a pipe is usually rigid whereas a blood vessel is going to be elastic anything else anything else you can think of that would be um misconception of this analogy that we have to clear right away between blood and a blood vessel and water and a pipe color excellent rachna so we don't want to assume that blood is colorless fantastic fantastic i didn't think of this exactly another thing i can think of is blood has cells whereas water doesn't have you know anything analogous to cells in it correct <laughs> so when you discuss these things it's important to use analogies to discuss science but it's also important to point them point out places where they there are gaps you know and thank you rachna for bringing that up okay biology lends itself very well for analogies and if you look at this these examples i have given you if you look at the left which is a plant 
of structure of a plant blood is a live heterogeneous fluid very true heterogeneous different blood cells and water is not right it's only hydrogen and oxygen excellent very true um if you so coming to an analogies or why biology lends well for analogies is if you look at the left you see different arrangements or different structures of organization of plant life and you see mammalian life or human life now trees are not humans but if you really look deeper there is something analogous to an organ system there is something analogous to a leaf which is an organ then you can look at tissue which is like any tissue nervous tissue then you can look at it even at cellular level so this doesn't mean they are identical but if you wanted to explain to someone um something that they are unfamiliar with uh, you could use them as examples right you could look at a leaf and say this is a tissue of a plant similar to your tissue in your in your head which is your brain so analogies are good in biology because we may not have all had a common origin or a common evolution but somehow adaptations for function are similar like bats have wings birds have wings one is avian one is mammalian moths have wings which are insects butterflies have wings right so that's adaptation for a common function which is to fly okay thank you krish if you're saying i'm teaching very nicely thank you this is wonderful thank you for making me feel very good and you've broken the ice for me <laughs> okay so then there's convergence of structure like a squid a squid is very small lives below the ocean it's aquatic life lives in the ocean and then you can have its streamlined body which is very similar to a penguin right a penguin is also adapted to swim though it may live part of its life on land and a third example of this kind of common theme is egg guarding egg guarding happens in spiders where after they lay their eggs they tend to you know sit on them till the eggs reach a place where they hatch similarly you have egg guarding in reptiles you have egg guarding in several others now this all this means is that you can explain one entity using an example of another which you are more familiar with a very common theme in biology which is fascinating to understand is that of super organisms so have has anyone heard of super organisms before anyone familiar so basically what super organisms are is that um they are okay thank you krish they are individuals so when many individuals come together the whole the entire entity of individuals develops properties that cannot be seen in in the individuals right they are develop properties as a group as a collective and it's important to okay sponges are super organisms very true raj just like corals i put an example there super bugs tanya no super bugs are nothing to do with super organisms but super bugs can form super organisms and i'll tell you how a bee hive fantastic dr renuka so this this common property of the group is not a sheer num fact of numbers it is not a sheer additive effect it is something that is contributed by individuals and present in the group but uh, you know alone and in isolation these features will not exist now a simple example is a termite mound or an ant colony right it has certain an individual ant can never build something as structured as this it has to be millions of ants that come together build the structure build the channels the architecture similarly corals right the form of the coral you see is not just one coral it's many corals that have built this 3d architecture another example is school of fish shoals of fish this is even more complex as a super organism because they even move together unlike corals and termite mounds which are sessile so shoals of fish move and if you look at an example of piranha shoals they can attack a shark or a whale which an individual piranha is so small that it can't do so that is a collective property of behavior right that it acquires now these collective properties are known as emergent properties so they have emerged from this collect and that's why they are called emergent properties okay krish thank you i will go a little slow that's feedback i've received before in my life all right <laughs> okay so everyone good with super organisms and emergent properties is there anything supernatural about super organisms okay i thought this question would get more answers more quickly is there anything supernatural about them no exactly rachna thank you they're just collects they're just collects of individuals and they have properties as a group as a result 
Now, a classic example of superorganisms, like Dr. Renuka mentioned, is beehives. Yes, Tanya, they all work together. Nothing supernatural. True, very true. So beehives, everyone seen a beehive? All the young people in the group, everyone see a beehive? Amaya talks of a siphonophore. To be honest, Amaya, I don't know anything about this. So maybe at the end of the talk, you can explain to us what this siphonophore is. Then we will also learn something. I have no idea. Okay, as I told you, I study biofilms. I don't study insects. I'm just using it as an analogy. I think I set the stage. So beehives are typical superorganisms, right? They are made up of parts, which are your bees, that come together and form this structured community in which you know thousands of bees live together. And no individual bee can build the whole hive, and no individual bee can make all the honey, and no individual bee can perform all the various functions we are going to talk about, right? So everyone has heard of beehives, has seen beehives, you're familiar with that? Yes? Krish, Tanya, Smruti, Ameya, yes, familiar. So we thought since beehives are macroscopic, which means we see them, we've, you know, somewhere along the way heard about them, we could use this as an example to explain biofilms, which are also superorganisms. So let's come to that. So what are biofilms? All right, so before we proceed, anyone heard of biofilms? Okay, excellent. No, yes, no, yes. Okay, so it, it's going to vary, right? Definitely, you, I think you would not have heard of biofilms as much as you've heard of beehives. Why? Because biofilms are microscopic. They are invisible to the naked eye, so you need a microscope to see them. And they, generally, we don't study them in, in our, or encounter them in our everyday life as an entity like beehives. So what are they? Biofilms are superorganisms. They are structured communities of microbes. Often bacteria, could even be fungi. They're structured communities embedded in a matrix, and that is an extracellular matrix. We'll talk about how that is made. So are you already seeing some similarities between biofilms and beehives? Correct, Shruti. There are groups of cells that sustain collectively. Biofilms are used in wastewater treatment. Very good, Sushma. We have a slide on that. Are you all, just by this definition or these first two slides, are you seeing some similarities between the two entities? Yes, Krish, can you quickly tell collective efforts of cells or parts, whereas in case of beehives, it's bees. So we have this notion that bacteria live singly. They live in isolation and they are what they call planktonic or free living. The term is planktonic, I'll just type it, or free living. But the truth is, bacteria have remarkable social lives. Bacteria have their own version of microbial Facebook, you know. So they have this, they, they exist in communities. They like to get together, which is biofilms. They communicate with each other. They like each other. They indicate, you know, who is attending an event near you. They tell you who is connected to whom and how in some ways. So bacteria have remarkable social lives. And this social life of a bacterium is a biofilm. So what is the meaning of planktonic? Krish, planktonic means free living. It's exactly what I'm showing here in green. You, we always think the canonical image of bacteria is that they are living in isolation, like what we see in tubes when we grow them in the lab. But the truth is when bacteria exist, they exist in communities, like in wounds. One of the reasons wounds don't heal is because biofilms form. Bacteria infect the wound and form the biofilm. Okay, if I tell you all that I hope you've cleaned a biofilm today morning, and I'm giving you a hint by pointing to something on the slide. What am I referring to? If I tell you, I hope you've all clean, cleaned a biofilm in the... <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Absolutely. That's why I said, I hope. I hope you've all cleaned a biofilm. So every morning when we brush our teeth, we are cleaning a biofilm, basically. Overnight, a plaque forms. And that dental plaque is a biofilm. Biofilms also form on catheters. So you can see that. So these structured communities pose public health clinical, medical problems. In addition, there are environmental issues because they form on rocks, they form on your sewage treatment lines, um, they form in oceans, they can form in surfaces of oceans. And so it's an environmental issue, it's a public health issue. And that's why people study biofilms. Okay, so we've got this down that both beehives and biofilms are very different, macroscopic, microscopic, bees, bacteria, and yet they're both superorganisms because the sum of the parts is more 
the sum of the the whole is more than the sum of the parts. That's what I'm trying to say, right? The whole entity is more than the sum of the parts. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Ship hull. Very good, Geeta. Very good. You know what? They are barnacles that on the ship hull, uh, bi biofilms grow on those barnacles. Very true. Okay. Very good. Excellent. Thank you, Krish. Okay. Uh, so uh, all of you are being very responsive. And uh, when I need a pick me up, I'm going to contact you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So we are going to discuss biofilms using an analogy of beehives under four big basic categories. The first one is the structure, the development and structure. The second category is how do bees or bacteria in a biofilm communicate? And we'll see how we can compare that to beehives. The third is, is there division of labor in a biofilm? We're going to discuss that. Can different parts of the biofilm perform different functions? Because you know we are saying it's a super organism. It has to have features that the individuals won't have. And the last point is what are the emergent properties in biofilms and why they are so important? Okay, so we are going to, is this everyone good so far? We are going to use beehives to understand biofilms better. So that the next time you can look around you and think of things like biofilms, which you will not see with the naked eye. Okay, so Amir says, barnacles grow on shells of turtles. So biofilm is microbial. Barnacles are not microbial. They are, uh, I don't know, they're crustaceans. They're some kind of aquatic feature. But bacteria grow on the barnacles that are attached to the hull. Of the of the ship that's what i mean okay thank you amen okay all right so let's start with development of structure so everyone krish geeta smriti janvi tanya ame everyone has seen a beehive yeah everyone has seen a beehive so what are they they are colonies if you think about them they are colonies of beehive of bees which have assembled and formed a structure beehives host thousands of bees now in a beehive for example, a very common beehive we see is the European bee, which is your apis, mellifera. You have queen, everyone's familiar, you have a queen bee and you have other types of bees as well, right? Now the worker bees are the, they are the workers, I mean, pretty much, right? That they, they explain, it's self-explanatory. You don't expect a queen to be doing much work, but it's the worker bees that secrete wax, beeswax from their abdominal glands, which you can see here. And this results in a structured honeycomb, your three-dimensional hexagonal comb. Now, what is important in this is to note that the wax is self-produced. It is not collected. It is self-produced wax. All right. Now, how do bees begin to start their hive? And then we are going to go into biofilms very soon. So you have bees which are called scout bees, which as their name suggests, they go scouting for good places. Like, you know, they are your real estate hunters. They scout for good bee real estate. And so Krish, Geeta, Ame, Janvi, what is good bee real estate? What is bee real estate? Orchards, trees, you know, uh, dark, dampy places, you know, crevices, rocks, things like that, right? So the scout bees go and look for locations. They choose a location. There are very few bees, and these are worker bees. They choose the location based on temperature, moisture, humidity. All right, they come back to their original colony and do a waggle dance. That is their communication, their uh, physical communication to other members saying, okay, I think there's a good spot there. Let's go check it out. Then a few more bees go there. And when a sufficient number of bees reach, then the hive or the colony starts to get built. And it does exactly what it's supposed to do. It starts secreting abdominal uh, gland wax and builds your three-dimensional hive. So this is something we're familiar with. You see bees flying around. You see a few clustered together, right? And then as you see, the hive keeps growing, right? If you've ever seen a hive in progress. Correct. Very good, Sachi. High-rise buildings, terraces, trees. Very good. Okay, so is everyone ready to listen to the biofilm analogy of development and structure that you may not be familiar with? Excellent. Okay, so let's see what happens in bacteria. So bacteria, single bacteria, are constantly searching for a good place to form a community. They attach to a substrate. That substrate can be biotic or abiotic. So I just named some biotic, abiotic. Can you name a biotic substrate? Can any of you name a good biotic place where bacteria would like to settle down? Wounds, surface of your teeth, because saliva forms a thin film, rocks, whatever. It finds, rock is abiotic, but it finds a good su substrate. 
So like the scout bees, the few bacteria that go check out the location. Many factors influence whether it's going to settle, whether there is huge flow, what is the temperature, what is the nutrient availability. So a few bacteria go and settle down. Once they find that it is suitable, they start producing signals and that signal is called density signaling. And we'll talk about that in chemical communication, but they've start producing signals that signal to other bacteria that, hey, there is, you know, it's good here. There's a lot of good stuff going on here. Why don't you come? It's exactly like Facebook. If you see too many people checking into an event near you, you tend to go and look, oh, wow, that seems, that seems interesting, you know, right? Let's go and check it out. So they do this via signals, small diffusible signals. We'll talk about that in detail. So when this happens, more bacteria come. And at this point, a bacteria is said to have achieved quorum. Very good, Janvi. So what does quorum mean? Have you heard of quorum in meetings and boardrooms? Have you heard that, oh, we can't have this meeting. We don't have quorum. What does quorum mean? A quorum means sufficient number, certain number, true. So if you have 15 people in a board, uh, you need at least 10 people, whatever the number they decide to have achieved quorum. So bacteria signal to achieve quorum, and that is called quorum sensing, a minimum attendance. Very good, very good, Rachna Sakshi. So then once this quorum is achieved, the bacteria starts to produce its matrix. This matrix is called extracellular polymeric substance. It's a mixture of proteins, polysaccharides, but it is again self-produced. It is produced by the bacteria. And then the matrix gives the bacterial community or the biofilm a three-dimensional structure the bacteria replicate in this matrix, so the biofilm matures. And at some point when the biofilm uh, has grown, bacteria can disperse and go and seed new locations. So this is how bacteria develop biofilms. And now if you want to make an analogy for the first part between beehives and biofilms, what are the points that we'll talk about? Are both matrices self-produced? Yes or no? Sachi, Janvi, Ankit. Uh, Ankit, I'll answer your question. Is the mechanism similar to quorum sensing? Yes. So matrices are self-produced. Are both matrices solid? Beeswax is solid, right? As you can see, it's a solid structure, hexagonal structure. Are both matrices solid? No. Matrix of biofilm, EPS, is viscoelastic. It is best described as semi-solid, if you don't want to use the term viscoelastic. So it's not solid. Is it static? Do you think the biofilm matrix is static? Meaning, is it uh, capable of allowing molecules and substances and gases to diffuse? Or is it static like your beehive architecture? Jelly-like, very true. It is jelly-like. It is not static. Biofilm substrate is, it is, you know, there is flow. There is, it's dynamic. There is movement through it. Very true. They both have, so beehive is primarily mechanical role, whereas the biofilm uh, the substrate has mechanical role. It serves as a scaffold, allowing more cells, bacterial cells, to come and attach. It has a transport role for nutrients and gases. It also has a protective role, and we'll come to that later. Okay, Josna, I'm not so sure about the definition of a colloid, but generally, we refer to it as viscoelastic. Okay. Uh, adsor yeah, yes, it adsorbs. True, true, it adsorbs. If that is it, yes. Beehive is fatty. What do you mean by fatty? Tanya, tell us what you think fatty is. Okay. All right. So is everyone okay with the first part? Shall we move on to the... Yeah, it's made of wax too. It is. Okay. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Lipid. Lipid content. Whereas in biofilm, the matrix is protein and polysaccharide. Very true. Good point. Good point. Very good point. I didn't think of that. Yeah. The biofilm matrix is not a lot of lipid. It's protein and sugars. Excellent. Okay. Very good, Krish. Thank you. So moving on to the... Now it gets more interesting. Okay. So bacteria have gone and formed a biofilm. How do bacteria communicate in this biofilm? Let's try and understand it with beehives. Okay. So we know that bees have very sophisticated communication mechanisms. It's outstanding if you read about it, actually. And I'm not an entomologist, but I'm fascinated by them. So you mean, uh, every hive has a queen, a queen bee, right? So she secretes these pheromones, a mixture of which is called the queen mandibular pheromone from some of her glands. And that basically reigns supreme on the hive. It tells the worker bees that they need to work when the worker bees get the signal. It signals to the drones, the men, that she's receptive to mating. 
So she produces reproductive supremacy by making other worker bees sterile. So no new queens can form. If one queen is there, you don't have another queen. She's an undisputed entity of her colony. All right. So that's the function of the queen bee. So she reigns and she basically is like this orchestra. She's coordinating this whole, she's like a conductor of an orchestra. Then you have the worker bees who are obviously going to do the work. So they get the signals and you know they secrete pheromones to communicate to each other that, oh, it's foraging time or it's time to build honey, collect pollen, whatever it may be. Or the worker, the queen is going to lay eggs. So they take care of the brood. And then you have the males who pretty much only signal that they are ready to mate. Quite a fascinating social structure, I must say. I wouldn't draw parallels with any, any human forms. Okay, so as you can see, beehives are very, very sophisticated communication uh, entities. Okay, so how does this community, thank you, Tanya. It was meant to be funny, thank you. I appreciate it. Since now I'm only seeing myself laughing, I don't know whether it's funny, but the feedback is much appreciated. So let's look at, bio, uh, let, let's look at this in a little bit of detail. Okay, so you have different kinds of pheromone signals and the queen actually secretes a bulk, like multiple chemicals making one pheromone mix, what you call it, right? Her perfume is a pheromone mix. So the workers take care of the brood, the workers check on the queen to make sure she's, well, is she mating, is she dead? Then a new queen needs to be reared, whatever. And the queen signals to the workers and the drones, depending on what she wants them to do. So as you see, this chemical communication basically conducts the whole hive. Mating, worker activities, reproduction, so, all right? So this is critical. Any block in this communication will lead to dissolution of the hive. Fair enough, correct? Okay. Now let's see how this happens in biofilms. In biofilms, thank you, uh, Krish. Very interesting to learn, thank you. I'm trying to make it so. In biofilms, bacteria, when they settle, they start producing signals. This signal is to achieve quorum, as we said. So when there are few bacteria, the signal that is produced is very diffuse. It's like only five people checking into an event on Facebook. You're like, you know what? I don't know if it's going to be that great. But if like 50,000 people are checking in, you're like, oh, okay, I need to notice this. I need to, what is going on? So when more bacteria accumulate, the density of the signal increases. That's why it's called density dependent communication. All right. Now, what are these signals? We'll talk about them. But if you think about this, if you're only doing something to signal, do you want this thing that is produced by the bacteria to be very energetically expensive? Like if you only want to like a post on Facebook, do you want to have to go through three verification steps? Like fill in the CAPTCHA code, where do you see a bus? You know what I'm talking about, right? All those, which, which image has a bus? Certainly not, right? You want to be like, okay, I want to be done. I want this to be quick and cheap and I want to move on. So that's exactly what these signals are. They are small, they are diffusible and they're energetically inexpensive to make. Okay, so these are chemical molecules. It also helps the bacteria to do this and why it's important that it has this group behavior is certain functions are less beneficial if done alone. For example, if you want to throw a morcha, I'm not encouraging anybody to do this, okay? Uh, uh, Dr. Usha, please don't think I'm, uh, I'm inciting a coup. I'm, I'm not planning to do that. But if you want to discuss a fee hike in your college, would it make sense for one person to go and stand and say, Are fee kyu badaya mera? It makes sense to say, Are, you know, you'd communicate and say, Are, tum log bhi aao. everybody speak, na? Kuch to bolo. So this is, this is the function of communication. It's to do things which make sense as a group. And what are those things? One, biofilms. Why would five bacteria form a biofilm? You want a big community. So you quorum sense, you signal density dependent signal to get more. To bioluminescence. For bioluminescence, you know, some bacteria luminescence, like there is, that's how uh, quorum sensing was first discovered in the organ of a squid. Yes, very true. In some Hawaiian uh, waters. So this bioluminescence means you have to have many producing that light, right? Now, ek bulb se kuch nahi hone wala. you need to have many bulbs producing that light. Producing spores. Spores are a state of dormancy. Why would you want few bacteria to become dormant? The whole community should become dormant. Only then is it going to be relevant to survive harsh conditions or stressors. Another function like motility, right? You want to signal that, no, that everyone, we should move now, for example. So chemical communication via quorum sensing provides group benefits. This is the um, take home point, right? Just like living in a beehive provides group benefits to different entities. 
because each one does another function the different function like the worker doesn't have to mate the drone doesn't have to collect food right okay so how do bacteria if you look at the molecule it's very similar to the pheromones so they are these very small diffusible chemical signals they are called auto inducers as the name suggests they induce themselves or if you're looking at them as a group right so a few bacteria start producing this auto inducer signal this signal is picked up by other bacteria and it starts to regulate changes in gene expression so this is a classical example of a bacterium pseudomonas have you heard of pseudomonas guys pseudomonas uh, one minute huh? let me not spell this wrong because i am in a chat window no so no yes okay pseudomonas is a very common environmental pathogen it's also a common pathogen of humans it affects immunocompromised people and it forms very difficult biofilms very difficult to treat now if you look at what happens in pseudomonas the lux i gene produces these auto inducers they are called acyl homoserine lactones or ahls ahl density increases when more bacteria accumulate and ahls as they function as auto inducers they come back into the cell now it doesn't mean your own ahl is coming back it's a common pool now and that's what the group benefit is okay there is nothing like my ahl and your ahl in bacteria right they function as a commune okay so then the ahls diffuse back and activate lux r which is a transcription regulator which binds to a particular transcription site and downstream of that activates all changes for group behavior like motility bioluminescence biofilm formation whatever it may be it may regulate motility under different circumstances right so these signals not only the pseudomonas signal to other pseudomonas other pseudomonas but it can also signal to not only aeruginosa it can signal to other uh pseudomonas species and other bacteria as well there is also so this is interspecies signaling there is also something called interkingdom where fungi and bacteria can interact with each other so it's not like because we are indian we don't speak we speak hindi so fair enough abhi hum ek dusre ko samajhte hain but if somebody from here was from netherlands i will have to speak a common language right i can't say aap mujhe samajh rahe ho ki nahi so that language may be english so they have some signals which are for their own people and some signals which are for you know everybody else if that's the way to describe it you know for foreigners okay so what have this is a gram negative pathogen gram positive pathogen staph also forms very robust biofilms and they don't do it through ahls ahl is gram negative usually they do it through small peptides which are called corum sensing peptides peptides are larger than ahls so they are not going to so easily diffuse out of the cell but they are pumped out fair enough so there's some energy involved in pushing these out the energy cost can be kept low when they come back in they activate some regulators which downstream activate changes in gene expression all right so is this good so far and the one auto inducer that's for inter species gram positive and gram negative is ai2 ai1 is usually restricted for amongst gram negatives ai2 is gram positive gram negative and you have others also that signal to fungi okay so now you're seeing how is this completely a genetic phenomenon or environmental factors are involved can you elaborate uh, production of ahls is genetic yes these ahls are specific to bacteria or fungi but environmental factors means as we said when they start settling on a surface they sense the environment in order to start you know signaling to other bacteria so that's where the environmental factor will come into play when they settle on a surface they find it suitable for biofilm formation is when they produce a large number of these ahls okay yes so yeah okay pseudomonas denitrifications yes it may be a source of vitamin b i'm not sure but i don't know if this is a human pathogen the name sounds more like environmental uh yes the receptors meaning uh, they need uh, yes you know yes they need to bind to some regulatory element yes when they come back in they need to bind okay all right so this was trying to explain chemical communication right so this is called corum sensing and if you see here in a biofilm in a catheter all these bacteria are producing these signals and signaling group behavior such as produce more matrix slow down don't move this is a good place stop your motility adopt a sessile lifestyle let's settle here this is a good house you know let's settle down or um what other group benefits do you think when a bacteria decides to settle down what are the other group benefits 
can you think of? Like the movie Parasite, protection. Okay, we'll come to that. The Matrix may provide that. Build up a niche. Okay, very good. Protection, safety, excellent, excellent. So the molecules can be AHS, they can be peptides, and this AI2 molecule, the purple uh, colored one, is the one that is the inter-species signaling. Okay, all right. So let's do a quick recap of communication in beehives versus biofilms. Are the molecules in both self-produced? Are mandibular pheromones or pheromones and auto-inducers or quorum-sensing peptides self-produced? Yes. Are they different types? Yes. Do they control different group behaviors? Yes. Are the group behaviors beneficial to the community? Yes, they are survival mechanisms. Bees, however, there is one difference. In bees, there is no evidence that Apis mellifera signals Apis dorsata. Right? I don't want you to leave with this misconception that bio bacteria don't inter-species or inter-kingdom signal. Bacteria actually can. Pseudomonas signals staph. Pseudomonas signals candida also, right? Almost all bacteria produce biofilms. Yes, yes. Depending on the circumstances, all have the capability to do it. Even fungi produce biofilms. Yes. Okay. So any questions about communication and biofilms? So we want you to understand biofilms, right? We are just trying to make this more relatable by using an analogy. So any more, uh, any more questions about communication in biofilms? Okay, Krish, thank you. Let's move on then. Has Krish spoken for the group? Okay. Now let's look at the division of labor. And I personally think this is the fun part, right? All biofilms cannot be, what do you mean? if it is a pathogenic organism, the biofilm is pathogenic. But if it's an environmental pathogen, then the biofilm may not, right? Does it affect the infectivity? Yes, that is why biofilm treated, biofilm infections are hard to treat. It does infect their virulence, their pathogenicity. Yes, oh, very good, very good questions. Medium of pheromone movement is air. Yep, it's like a perfume. But that's a good point because bacterial quorum sensing molecules diffuse through some medium like water or matrix or whatever. Yes, very true, Josna. They're volatile. Exactly. They're volatile. True. Okay, so let's look at division of labor. Okay. I think this is going to be a rough point to drive home and we are all overworked in lockdown. Okay, so I don't want, let, let's restrict ourselves to bacteria and beehives and not go any further. We are all dealing with division of labor, right? At such a time. And trying to survive as a community. Soldier bees, soldier bees are the, maybe a form of worker bees. Uh, I ha we haven't read this anywhere in, uh, in the literature. But thanks, Zen. Okay, so let's look at division of labor now. So we all said the queen, she's going to lay the eggs. A fertilized egg becomes a female. An unfertilized egg becomes a drone or a male. The female is going to be sterile because only one woman is sterile in that community and that is the queen. So that is the, a soldier caste found in termites. Okay, all right, all right. Okay, uh, we have a slide where you can add some things for that. Even we will learn something. Thank you, thank you. Keep that thought, Zen and Bindu. We'll come to that slide. Okay, so the queen egg lays, the worker bees, after she egg lays, the worker bees start making this royal jerry, which is a very proteinaceous fluid to feed the larvae. And the drones are done once they have functioned as um, to mate. The queen pheromone makes all the workers sterile. Okay, so this is how it goes. The queen lays the eggs. The workers do everything else, right? They are kind of like, I don't know what to call it, but the nannies of the hive. They rear the kids. They feed the kids. They clean the hive. They prospect for food. So there is a very structured division of labor in a beehive. We appreciate that, right? And some of us already may know that. Now, the interesting, fascinating question is, in a, another superorganism state, which also is known to have group benefits and group behaviors, does this division of labor exist? What do you think? Even before we go into it, now from what you know of biofilms, can you imagine some kind of division of labor in biofilms? Okay, Snehal says, soldier bees are bees that respond during attacks or intruders. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Vaishnavi says, may or may not, should be there. 
okay some we are coming back to the soldier bee conversation okay fine there has to be there has to be why else would they all want to be together then right plus because it is a structured community it's natural that those on the 10th floor are going to have a better view or a different view from those on the second floor right their environment is going to influence them in some way so definitely there has to be some division of labor and people have probed this look at this biofilm now the first thing you notice is that the top is different from the bottom correct syntrophic consortia very good krish fantastic fantastic that means they all have different functions that serve produce different uh, compounds or serve different purposes for degradation or whatever it may be right it's a synthetic beneficial community so bacteria on the top are going to be exposed to oxygen they are going to have more nutrients if you think of them in a catheter the bacteria lining the lumen of the catheter will have the flow of the fluids or whatever whereas those deeper are going to be in less oxygen environments there will be lesser of nutrients possibly so there is obviously going to be some division of labor and that was very well studied in this experiment where this was a biofilm formed on a surface of a catheter so it's green uh, red just means it's biofilm verdu is labeling all the active cells so under aerobic conditions under conditions where there's lots of oxygen where are the active cells come on janvi krish sanika tanya vaishnavi where are the active cells in the aerobic one where do you see the verdu labeling yes in the upper stratum correct under the anaerobic conditions where is the activity less oxygen so the lower parts seem to be active because the upper parts are dying they are not they are unable to survive that anaerobic environment and if you have pure oxygen again you see a shift on the top where the top layer is very thick and growing well because it has possibly more oxygen and that it, it does have more oxygen and it's going to grow more right so the biofilm structure peripheral layer is more exposed to change in environment right oxygen chemicals nutrients whatever it may be now i'm going to ask you a question for you to apply this knowledge if through this catheter you flowed in antibiotic which are the cells that are going to be most susceptible upper so that's why biofilms become difficult to treat the upper layer gets killed but the lower layers never get killed they remain in some form they persist and we are going to talk about that they are called persisters right so the structure of the biofilm community lends itself well for division of labor so this was further studied using a biofilm example of an of a soil pathogen called bacillus subtilis have you heard of this bacillus are these aerobic spores you know they are found everywhere if you keep a plate open on your dining table you will have bacillus spores growing on it the next day apart from mold and a lot of other stuff right okay so in bacillus when they form their biofilm matrix they have subpopulations of cells that perform different functions why is still to be understood but this is a fact now there are two components of their matrix one is a tas a protein which is an amyloid protein and one is the matrix the eps extracellular polysaccharide and other proteins so some cells produce only tas a some cells produce only AP, eps both together form a very robust biofilm how would you study something like this you study it by looking at can i remove eps production what do you see in this pink graph versus wild type if if you do, if you have bacillus subtilis cells that produce only tas a what do you notice about their fitness versus wild type they are less if they produce only eps and not tas a it's again less now look at the biofilms that form here you have wild type so wild type means what do they produce i'll i'll get to your question krish about why biofilms are important but everyone else in wild type what do you think the matrix consists of what two components in bacillus subtilis both very good very good done the next example is deletion this delta means a mutant mutant for eps so it's only producing tas a what do you notice about the biofilm compared to wild type less more same less very good zen now you look at tas a mutant it only produces eps less uh, yes maybe lesser but less and now if you look at both 
look at this biofilm and look at the wild type what do you notice if you have both added separately like basically one makes only tasse one makes only eps you put them together how is that biofilm similar or different from the wild type similar so that means you need both components but they are both produced by different subpopulations of cells is what this paper found so why would one cell bear the energy expense of producing two types of compounds why don't we just you make something i make something it's like it's like a, a trade right a trade system that benefits the group correct are you understanding so we are anthropomorphizing morphing bacteria or biofilms if you may say it's like a potluck totally tum chapati leke aao main bhaji leke aati hu job is done so that's what they are trying to say that let's that's what they are trying to say when they say there's division of labor right okay very good so let's do a comparison here there are different populations but now i want you to tell me all of you smriti tanya krish vaishnavi amazen what is the one difference you are thinking about in these subpopulations in biofilms and beehives what is the fundamental difference in the subpopulations they work together but a fundamental difference in what maybe my question has to be better fundamental difference in what decides that you become a queen or you become a worker versus you become you you know you stay you uh, 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 adopt aerobic metabolism you adopt anaerobic metabolism what is so in bio, in back in bee hives it is genetic whereas in biofilms it is heavily dependent on environmental factors or chemical factors right another thing biofilm bacteria i again don't want misconceptions it's not that if you are determined or dedicated to be your aerobic metabolic metabolism you are committed to that pathway you know if it leaves this biofilm disperses in another environment it may have a different metabolism so it's not a committed path it is circumstantial here whereas in bees it is committed a worker is not going to a male is not going to become a worker or a worker only one of them will become the queen and that's her function right of the of whatever the brood is i mean so in bees it's genetic whereas in biofilms it is dependent on environmental and chemical factors okay very true okay yes yes there is succession first come first serve position where the organism is in the biofilm will determine it so it's a changes in gene expression that is regulated by environmental and chemical factors okay excellent all right so let's come to the final part so we've built up towards this we've studied structure communication and division of labor now what are emergent properties in these two systems right so someone very nicely brought about termites and did our job of coming back to other analogies so we said emergent properties are those that emerge from the whole group the whole system and a collect so think about emergence in snowflakes uh, how are snowflakes formed why is a snowflake an emergent state yeah right one crystal of water no matter how it is shaped is not going to give you that pattern right it's a property of many crystals coming together now emotions are an emergent state why we feel something is a you know complex i mean needless to say that our emotions are complex right you can't attribute them to a single group of cells or neurons right it's an emergent property of the brain of all the neurons maybe there is uh, hyper there is sad sad and hyper so that's the state similarly even cities are emergent states because some people uh, take care of you know maybe the water some people take care of the sanitation some people they take care of roads so together it functions as an urban ecosystem right okay heart is also made up of heart muscles true 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 even a, uh, if you think of the heart as an electrical system that is also an emergent state right a single muscle can transmit the current but it cannot pump the heart the 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 pumping of the heart is an emergent property of thousands and i don't know millions of individual cardiac muscles very good very good fantastic okay i need to prepare better now next time when i come to you guys <laughs> okay so what are emergent properties in bee hives one of the major features is thermoregulation because bee hives are exposed and they need to keep 
keep the hive in a particular temperature for the survival of the queen so when it's very cold bees shiver to keep the hive warm when it is hot bees fan their wings to keep the hive cool so this is mainly the function of the worker bees right again they are doing that function now why is this an emergent property of the group because the younger bees cannot shiver so during this time they move towards the middle of the hive so that the older bees manage the thermoregulation on the outer aspect of the hive so the hive in the center is warm so this becomes an emergent state of the entire uh, entity of the beehive superorganism right so have you grasped this there are other emergent states for example even comb construction even building of the hive itself is a property of emergence one bee can't build it multiple bees perform this activity all right now let's look at emergence in biofilms the main feature that is important for biofilms the main emergent property is and i said it before can anyone guess can anyone guess what is the emergent property of biofilms that we are also concerned about i'm waiting krish uh, oxygen okay okay oxygen will be less in the inside of the biofilm protection protection from what janvi protection from what waiting 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 very true so the emergent property of biofilms that is a big concern is antibiotic resistance or antibiotic tolerance why does this happen multiple reasons one thing is the biofilm as a huge matrix matrix just functions as a barrier a single bacterium cannot make matrix that protects it from antibiotic right when it comes together as a community the matrix heaps up so this is a property of emergence a single bacterium can never make enough matrix to protect it right it is a community then when the biofilm is heterogeneous some groups of cells make enzymes that degrade the antibiotic so it protects the rest of the group right it's an emergent state then we talked about these cells that are in the center of the biofilm or possibly is somewhere in the biofilm that persist that they are called dormant cells or persisters persister cells as the name suggests they persist in spite of antibiotic odds in spite of all the, the stressors you subject them to all right i think it's a good a good lesson for us at a time of a pandemic that we need to persist in spite of all the yes hati hath badana true so they persist and uh, they help survival of the biofilm even if other cells die the biofilm community survives because persister cells do not die and repopulate the biofilm after the antibiotic or the stressful condition has moved on biofilms bacteria are also different from planktonic they are metabolically altered they slow down their growth so they are less susceptible to antibiotics because you know antibiotics act on growing cells like for example penicillin acts on cell wall synthesis it inhibits cell wall synthesis but to inhibit cell wall synthesis the bacteria actually has to be making a cell wall right if it says i don't want to make a cell wall boss i'm good then penicillin is going to have no action so maybe if you is the bacteria reduces its metabolism this is how it works they just become tolerant to antibiotics so the biofilm becomes an antibiotic resistant state which is very very difficult to treat and this is the clinical and public health krish you mentioned right why is biofilm a problem this is why it's a problem it this is the clinical problem how do you treat it you treat it it gets better but dormant cells repopulate that infection site again right this becomes the issue so emergent properties are critical in beehives are thermoregulation in biofilm is antibiotic tolerance both are coordinated responses and both serve some protection right and you have kind of spatial distribution where outer bees protect the inner bees so maybe you know the uh dormant cells are somewhere in the deep recesses of the biofilm and the outer cells take the hit of the antibiotics so that the dormant cells survive right you can think of them like that we can all of this may not have scientific evidence as yet to show but these are questions to explore if you think about it like that all right so we've talked through the an analogy okay i hope it's been interesting and i hope it changes the way you think of bacteria again right they are actually thriving lively i i think they're pretty fantastic creatures you know but whenever you're making an analogy we have to remember we shouldn't get carried away and this is the whole water in a pipe versus blood in a blood vessel kind of situation right 
no one should think that blood vessels are rigid unless there is atherosclerosis which is not a good situation to be in so let's think about where does this analogy fall let's be critical of our own analogy where does this fall through right first one so i want some of you to say now what is the first thing that you shouldn't go home with a misconception when it comes to bacteria in biofilms what's the first yes smruti i love that definition notorious fantastic creatures i know pretty much pretty much extremely dangerous yes so what's the first misconception smruti vaishnavi seema tanya yes bacteria are not eukaryotic don't think bacteria are they're not bees so this is not like a part part comparison right they are um prokaryotes their structure is very different from a eukaryotic bee so this is the first thing we never go back with this misconception meaning everything that comes with prokaryotes and eukaryotes like bacteria don't have a nucleus right they have just chromosomal uh, they have dna in their cytoplasm bacteria don't reproduce sexually it's an asexual reproduction so don't go away with all of these misconceptions right okay bacteria don't fly not that we know of so what any other that you any other limitations of the analogy these are this is the first place to start when you're breaking down such an analogy right no one should go back with a misconception what are the other things bacteria are structured differently they are you can they are prokaryotic they don't reproduce like bees what else unicellular multicellular exactly 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 microscopic macroscopic as we said right in the beginning and no one should look at think of bacteria as you know like nice fat plump bees flying around bacteria form spores unlike bees at least i don't know of bees forming spores i don't think so genetic exchange via conjugation happens in bacteria and other means bees may not have all those means of genetic exchange so anyway this idea is to is to not go back, go back with misconceptions of bacteria right we are using these to study bacteria okay all right so this fundamental difference is clear now what's another thing bees typically bee hives are either apis dorsata apis mellifera or one species of that bee european bee indian bee there are kind of bees but bacterial biofilms are mostly not single species they are almost always polymicrobial they are almost always multi species so don't go back with this misconception that only pseudomonas biofilm will have only pseudomonas or biofilm will have only staph oral biofilms are hugely mixed this diversity that you see here it's i don't know if it's an oral biofilm but it 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 it's, it's as diverse as this you see red filamentous bacteria you see green you see cocci you see rods you see blue so bacterial biofilms are actually highly polymicrobial so in wounds and in the oral cavity wherever they are found you can have fungal bacterial biofilms so this is the second misconception that you shouldn't go forward with that biofilms are single species yes biofilm matrix is not a structured hexagonal or you know it's it's a diffuse element and it's very dynamic and it's constantly changing dependent on environmental conditions and bacteria leaving the biofilm etc it's not as static or structured as a beef beehive so don't don't have that impression if you look at matrix under the microscope it looks like gel it just looks like a jelly a stretched out jelly you know okay very good excellent and the last part to in an analogy uh, exercise teaching exercise is to look at other super organisms and somebody here beautifully mentioned termites and soldier ants does anyone want to add that here can we think of some entity in biofilms analogous to soldier ants in termites if you tell me i can think if there's something like this you may not know all the details of biofilms but if you tell me what soldier ants do i might try and think soldier ant people this is your chance to protect the hive by speaking mm, they help protect the hive the dormant organisms are survivors too so uh, tanya has a question do some bacteria leave an original biofilm and venture for an adventure of course all the time all the time that 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 dispersal state is always happening in biofilm that is why biofilms are very very dynamic right social insects have a 
uh, have I mean, caste system, meaning they have a structured function role. Yes, right. So uh, they are an example of, you know, uh, everyone has to play their role in a community, right? And that everyone's role is important and indispensable. I think this is the best example. Everybody can't be queen. Somebody has to do the job of the worker, right? To keep the queen where she is. Absolutely. Soldiers are seen, okay. So if soldier ants are protecting their termite mounds, then you could think that the outer bacteria in a biofilm might be performing this protective role. They may be secreting the enzyme. What's the point if a bacteria right in the middle of the biofilm makes a degradative enzyme, like beta-lactamase that destroys beta-lactam antibiotics like penicillin? I mean, penicillin is not going to get there. It's a good that you are making of no use. So if you want penicillin to be destroyed, it should be the outer bacteria that make it. So yes, this is exactly what happens. The outer bacteria make that. So they may kind of be like the, the frontline defense, right? They could be the soldiers or the, or the border security force of the biofilm, right? Like, hey, first you deal with me, then we'll activate the rest of the army. Okay, great. So this is to, this slide is just to tell you that there are analogies with other superorganisms also that, that we can bring about and all of them will have limitations, right? For example, in a school of fish situation, the whole shoal moves, whereas in a biofilm, the whole biofilm will not move, only a part will disperse. So misconceptions should also be broken down at this point, right? Okay, now the whole idea of teaching with analogies is also to come up with new ideas that when you study fields in isolation, you may not be able to come up with. Now, one analogy I can think of is that, is there a, just like the queen, if the queen is destroyed or the queen is killed or the queen leaves the hive, the entire hive collapses. Like she's literally like holding it together, right? Her mandibular pheromone is what keeps everybody in check. She leaves, they don't sense her pheromone and everything dissolves. Can there be, if for biofilm researchers who want to find ways to eradicate or treat biofilms that are persistent and hard to treat, and a public health problem, can there be such a core of cells which is the Achilles tendon of the biofilm, where maybe it's the dormant cells, maybe it's the persistence, you treat that and the biofilm will dissolve. The chance of that biofilm coming back is limited. So this is the way you can use these analogies to try and think if there is such a weak spot in the biofilm. That could be the dormant cells or persistence or these metabolically inert cells. And research is going into understanding how they can be destroyed but they are extremely persistent, right? They go into this hibernation or dormancy and they revert when things get better. So they are like the phoenix rising from the ashes, you know, you can do whatever you want and they'll find out. Spores will secure the race, meaning what? I'm not sure, Sushma, you can explain. And Zen says at nuclear level, I don't know what nuclear level you're talking about, just explain. Smruti can surfaces of catheter, they are always treated, but the problem is it may persist. So then you remove the catheter, insert a new catheter. That can be done if it's on a catheter. What are you going to do if it persists in a wound? I mean, I, I, I don't think removing the leg and putting a new leg is a good option or a very viable, uh, sustainable option. So that's when we have to kill the biofilm, right? Okay. And another way to think about this is we use products of, collected products of beehives like propolis, wax, honey. Can biofilms be harnessed for their collective actions? Like if they produce a lot of enzymes. And this is also being done for bioremediation of waste, or especially hydrocarbon waste in oceans. Biofilms are being added because they, certain biofilms, they are environmental biofilms producing enzymes that degrade these hydrocarbon entities. So we can also think of harnessing biofilms for wastewater management, bioremediation, environmental conservation, based on the fact that as a community, they produce a sufficiently large amount of enzyme or degradative compounds that can destroy this, whereas few bacteria would probably not, would cannot do it, right? Okay. Uh, fair enough. I think we, I'm done. I, I, I think I, I, I got a little um, over time. But one thing we would like you to do is since we are developing this as a teaching module for school and early college levels and non-research uh, researchers in the field, if you could please scan this QR code and give us feedback. It's just, you know, quick questions, it will really help us in taking this further as an educational module and even publishing it. Of course, it's all, it's all anonymous. So feel free to uh, say, give us your honest thoughts. So if, if it's okay with everyone, if you can please take a screenshot and then uh, you know, just scan the QR code.
there is a link also but it's not clickable unfortunately yeah and i'm open to questions i hope you enjoyed this i thoroughly enjoyed it it's been way out of my comfort zone i can tell you that so i hope you've enjoyed it as well i'm 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 here to take questions so uh, sachi has a question here how are silicon catheters better so catheters are often coated with different materials you know bio materials they probably help uh, they prevent the adhesion of bacteria so when this initial sensing has to happen it's a mechanical sensing for the bacteria to attach it has to sense something and then it starts producing eps and actually even at that level of sensing there is an enormous amount of research being done my own phd lab has worked in extensively on this so if you make a surface that is slippery or you know that uh, i don't know which way you will describe it but that mechanical feedback is not there then maybe bacteria adhere less how are they currently being treated well you know my research lab wants to change that they are currently being treated with just antibiotics you are just throwing antibiotics at the problem and we think there may be alternative approaches non conventional approaches used alone or in combination with antibiotic like maybe uh, probiotic approaches uh, laser blue light therapies natural compounds uh, thank you uh, galaxy a9 uh -huh. that's a nice name so do the disinfectants and soap interfere with biofilms surfactants do surfactants do destroy biofilm um soaps may possibly just have a mechanical effect at disrupting them uh, i don't know if they are able to kill bacteria in a biofilm yep it's probably going to be a mechanical like an abrasive effect it will it yeah super bugs basically is because you're throwing antibiotics at it the few cells that remain become resistant they ex they get exposed to the antibiotic they develop resistance and now you get a resistant biofilm so this sub optimal long term treatment is what is causing antibiotic resistance and the use of antibiotics in biofilms is fueling this tremendously can coating yes silver nanoparticles yes catheters even uh, prosthetic knees prosthetic hips uh, are all co often coated with silver nano there are products coated with silver nanoparticles to prevent biofilm formation all of these external devices cardiac um, what do you call those valves that we add those prosthetic cardiac valves are sites of biofilm formation uh analogy does work but with limitations in teaching field okay thank you so much bindu please give us this as a feedback in our feedback form please tell us what are the limitations we would like to know that we would like to know that yes we have tried to address uh what the limitations are but i i can see that you already all of you had ideas that uh, that we didn't think of so please do tell us yeah yes vaishnavi thank you thank you very much very much thank you tanya thank you for all your responses you made you brought the session to life thank you 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 all of you just came along with it you know so um I I have any more questions Smriti anybody else please let us know and do fill the feedback that's just one request i have i hope that is okay dr usha yeah definitely okay. uh, please we, thank you we believe in very, uh, being very open and um, many of our teachers are equally interested in sharing yes. and uh, i think this is the best way that uh, we also become a biofilm yeah <laughs> yeah so we share with each other <laughs> Yes, absolutely. But I had one question. Yeah. Uh, why analogy only with the uh, animal system? Why can't you think something with uh, uh, plants? What if you compared an inflorescence with a biofilm? Ah, uh, I don't know. Loud thinking. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. That's a good point, and that's exactly the part of analogy is when you Loud use it thinking, in teaching. Yeah. yeah, yeah. They say yeah. you should compare it with different systems so that the pitfalls of the analogy can be. Yeah. when you use analogizing as a teaching mm -hmm. tool with inflorescence now i is in 
Are you you should know more than me. I don't know in fluorescence, but is it a uh, is it a uh, even you, because see, uh, you also build something, and uh, we do use a lot of analogy analogy. But sometimes what happens, you know, the students remember the. the example more than what the topic yeah. that we are trying to tell them so that yeah. also becomes at times a little overwhelming you know yes 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 so exactly. just thinking along the line when you, yes you said about division of labor and how it is structured and how things are uh, in terms of functioning but uh, biofilms by such, as such is a very uh, amazing topic i had a general question what about your dental care uh, this thing because that's one area of a big concern. Yes, what about dental? The dental what? Yeah, because that's a very good substrate, right? For your Have biofilms. You? Yes, yes, what about it? Your teeth. Yes, it's a very good substrate, yes, yes, exactly, exactly. And all the properties we described apply to dental biofilms as well. All of them. Yeah. There is spatial segregation, aerobic, anaerobic metabolism. Mm. Yes. So I think anybody who is uh, looking for making a toothpaste is always worried okay, how they uh, can take care of that uh, consortium. Yes, exactly. 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 And at least in the oral cavity, the biofilm will keep coming back every 24 hours because microbes inhabit yes. the cavity. So there's no way to eradicate it completely forever. I mean, they need it also. Well, very mind. beautiful slides and uh, very nice way. And your entire session was very interactive. That was yeah, thank amazing. You. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very nice. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so I think they're very we good points, Dr. Usha. Like plants in a forest communicate or, <laughs> yeah. I think there were some very, very good points. So if they're all there in the feedback, that will be great. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yeah, sure, sure. But uh, it was really amazing. You're a wonderful uh, teacher. Thank I you. wish all of us uh, take some uh, tips from you. And uh, we, as I mentioned earlier, we are all lifelong teachers. Yeah, and yeah, exactly. uh, from each other, we learn a lot. Yes, exactly. How to, yeah. and basically, I think somewhere in the 11th and 12th standard, we have to make everything very, very interesting so that uh, the students don't look at it as a mundane task yes exactly very so, true very if you true. have any more of these which you can share with us we'll be very happy sure i'm happy to do it anytime and i can share whatever we have so ma'am the yeah. best place for whatever communication work we do is our website our mm. lab website that will be the best place okay. we share whatever resources we have we put them up Thank sure, you sure. so much. Thank you for the invitation. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And uh, it was an offbeat yeah. approach for the lecture. So thank you for, you know, giving it life. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. you so much, Dr. Himansh, your uh, comments. Yeah, sure. Uh, is Dr. Himanshu uh, connected still? Yeah, we had a very diverse uh, type of uh, audience, teachers, students, some school students also, because uh, we wanted everyone to be involved in it and uh, listen to a very different type of uh, uh, speaker. And uh, your name really came out of blue when I asked my friend, Dr. Deepak Modi, yeah. because we are all very big fan of Deepak. Okay. And yeah. he said, oh, I a uh, friend who, who is a good teacher. I said, okay, let me try. And uh, thank you so much, Karishma, for uh, uh, accepting our invitation. And uh, really, I'm very sure many students have written very, very happy. They're so happy about it. And uh, we will also be in touch with each other. Definitely. And uh, let us all work together uh, to Anytime. make this world a better place. And especially for the student community. I think that learning should be a fun process for them. And uh, you have been a wonderful uh, communicator and you have uh, expressed very well. And I love that analogy. And anyway, these are always our all time favorites because they teach us a lot of values. True. How to do exactly. everything right from coordination to taking care of things, staying together. And uh, these value systems we imbibe by looking at the life cycle of the bees. And from you, uh, we have learned how you can be very enthusiastic 
<laughs> about uh, what you are doing. Yes. So God bless you and uh, thank you thank so you. much for this wonderful evening that we have spent with you. Thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks, thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to the students. Very, very actively. Thank you. And Dr. Himansu, your uh, yes, final sir. word. Yes, he is our sweet, uh, very sweet uh, um, new principal and he will have his <laughs> final word. Thank you so much, Karish. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, madam. And Karishwa, madam, it was really indeed a very, very engaging lecture. And you kept everyone as uh, involved with you. That's uh, perhaps the best quality a teacher has and all that, you know, that uh, not a single person from the, I mean, I could see the uh, messages that were uh, popping in every time and all. So you kept us all engaged. It was a wonderful evening for us. Thanks. Uh, we wish you all the very best in all your future endeavors. Thank and, you. Uh, uh, on behalf of each one of us, uh, I thank you. Uh, thank you so thanks much. Thanks to Usha Madam also for this uh, thought that she just uh, floated and that uh, not one day, two day, but there are seven days completed and we still have many more lectures lined yes, each yes. day from different... That's fantastic, fantastic, yes. fantastic. Absolutely. So thank you, Madam, for a appreciating. Thank this, you for having see, me. This is another good quality. This is another good quality of a teacher, you know, appreciating... Yes. Uh, <laughs> The efforts of the others. So once again, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank and you. I must and say thank uh, you to the students because they really brought it to life. They were very right. interactive. Very interactive. Thank yes, you. yes. That's what I said. Yeah. Yes. Each one of us was so engaged and all that. That time was not even uh, noticed. Thank you very much. Yes, yes, exactly. Thank you. Take, Take care. care. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. And now with the permission of the guest speaker, uh, we complete today's lecture. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.